Wait, okay. Oh, I was just pushing the wrong button, that's all. No biggie, no biggie. That's all right. I am excited this morning. I am so excited. Um, well, to begin, let's, let's, let's start with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be, be before my church family and before you to give a little wisdom to some things that I want to point out in the Bible. There are so many things to point out, and you have so much knowledge, and it's such a beautiful book of love, and also of reason and respect. So I just praise you, Lord, and help me through this sermon, and uh, just make everybody listen and um, get something out of what I have to say. I just praise you, Lord, and thank you. Hallelujah! <laughs> Okay, kind of a little outline of what I'm going to do today. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention was um, when we had our secret sister reveal, um, Diane uh, gave us the, the theme for the year of bragging. And bragging, I think, not so much about yourself, but bragging about other people. Never hurts to say you did a good job thank you, or any of those things like that. And the joy you see on someone's face when you actually appreciate them for what they have done is really an awesome thing. So I think the church should take that on as a theme for this year, besides just the women. We'll include the whole church in it and say nice things to people and just really make them feel good. Make sure you mean it first. Don't say it out of pretense of making somebody feel good. But if it's honest, then it's good. First of all, I'm going to go into James for a moment. That was on our reading for this week. Then the Beatitudes, Matthew, Luke, and Revelations. When I started my research, I was surprised to find that Revelations was included in this. As you know, I've always been what I'd call a Christian, but not until I came to this church was I really a Christian and into the word of the Lord. I have learned a lot, and every time I get to come up here and speak, it gets me motivated and it gets me going. And um, I just, all these things go through my head. I just want to tell you everything. But I have to calm it down and, and uh, just pick out one theme. And for some reason, Beatitudes just kind of jumped in my mind, and I don't really know a lot about them. Like I said, I didn't even know there were Beatitudes in Revelation. And so, that's what we're going to go through today. And then at the end, I have a couple of, of um, verses out of Ephesians. So I'm actually covering what we were on the reading on what was on the reading list today and throwing Beatitudes in the middle. My first introduction to Beatitudes was from Catherine several years ago. I, can, I can't believe I can say several years ago already. She would send me little notes from the Bible to read, and, and it was always just some little tidbit that she thought would be important. And she is the one that sent me the Beatitudes. And last, no, forget that part. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover, but I think we can do it. Everybody says I always do a short sermon, so we'll see what happens. I covered James in a prior message, and there was something that I've just been thinking about a lot. I remember when I first ran across it, it really hit home and a problem that I fight with all the time. We stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their body in check. When we put bits in the mouths of the horses to make them obey, we can turn them where we want them to go. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are stirred by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body. It makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by just a small spark. The tongue is also fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself set a fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. 
With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. This should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Think before you say th something that might possibly hurt someone. Um, I've, I've heard some things being said, and I am, I am totally guilty of it myself. I actually, when pastor comes back, I need to apologize him because I said something just real flippant and was not in the proper perspective. Praise people that do good. It's a joy to see their faces light up when you praise them. <clears throat> And I apologize if my voice kind of gets funky because I'm still getting over that, whatever it was. <clears throat> so anyway, this I'm going to call help from a friend. I told, I was telling last week what my sermon was going to be on this week. And um, I got home and I got a text. And it was a wonderful little message from a friend. And I'm going to read that to you now. And it flows right into what we got to do. I've read this passage over and over. This time it popped out that then he opened his mouth. Anytime it's important enough for it to be noted that Jesus opened his mouth, we had better pay attention. According to one source, it should take about four hours to read through all the words of Jesus. Consider how long it would take to read the Bible to completion. Those four hours or some 3,000 words in English are pretty important. Jesus' ministry on earth, although brief, was a most important and powerful ministry. It would sure be worth our time to study those words so closely and apply them to our lives. Jesus wasn't just a great teacher or a nice guy or even the highest prophet. He is God. Listen up. Okay, and here we go. In these meetings that I research for uh, the Beatitudes, it names the Beatitude, it explains it, and then at the bottom, at the very bottom, it has a paraphrase, paraphrase that just kind of sums it all up in, in, well, I call it plain English, but anyway. The meaning of Beatitudes come from the word Latin, Beatitudo, is that correct? Beatus. Huh? Beatus. Oh, Beatus, okay. I knew I could look for him and he'd tell me the right name. Anyway, its meaning is blessedness. The phrase blessed are in each beatitude, which implies a current state of happiness or well-being. This expression held a powerful meaning of divine joy and perfect happiness to the people of Christ's day. In other words, Jesus was saying, divinely happy and fortunate are those who possess these inward qualities. While speaking of a current, current blessedness, each pron pronouncement also promised a future reward. The Beatitudes introduce and set the tone for Jesus' Sermon on the Mount by emphasizing the humble state of humans and the righteousness of God. Each Beatitude depicts the ideal heart condition of a citizen of God's kingdom. In this idolic state, the believer experiences abundant spiritual blessings. <clears throat> So the first beatitude that is Matthew, starts all in Matthew, is blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The phrase Jesus uses, poor in spirit, refers to one's spiritual condition. Those that are poor in spirit realize that nothing they can do, nothing they can do can get them into heaven. They are powerless, helpless, and undeserving. They don't sound very blessed, do they? They are blessed because Jesus has not forgotten them. They are promised the king kingdom of heaven. This flies in the face, the w face of the way the world operates. It's the strongest and most put, put together people that get the good life, but not so in God's kingdom. It's those who become poor, those that recognize their own need, those that cry out for their savior that will receive the kingdom. If we want the best life each of us must first make ourselves poor in spirit. We must recognize our dire situation and that the only way out is to rely on God. And the paraphrase for that one is, blessed are those who recognize their dire need for God, for God will bring them into his kingdom. 
second beatitude is blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforter, comforted. Jesus isn't talking about mourning over a loss of a loved one, although that is talked about elsewhere. Here Jesus is speaking of the mourning of repentance. Jesus is continuing the theme that was started in the previous verse. First, he, blessed, he says, blessed are those who recognize their sinfulness and need for a savior. Now he adds, blessed are those who mourn for their sin, for they will be comforted. Jesus is saying that in the brokenness of your sin, God is with you. It is that brokenness that you will find hope, healing, and experience the good life, life to the fullest. And the paraphrase for that one would be, blessed are those who mourn their sin, for God will forgive them to the life he intended them to have. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In Jesus' previous statements, he dis was describing our personal recognition of our circumstances. Now Jesus switches gears and he starts talking about our outward posture and expression. A good definition of meek is strength under control. Think of, think, uh, well, hey, wait a minute, I got a typo here. Think of a dad wrest wrestling with his kids. The dad could end it. He could just knock a kid out and end it right there. But instead, he uses his strength for the benefit of the kids. That's meekness. That's strength under control. This is what Jesus is calling us to do today. He is calling us to have our strength under control. He is calling us to leverage our strength for the benefit of others. He's calling us not to throw our weight around to get what we deserve. Why should we? We are already heirs to the throne of God. What else could we need? And the paraphrase for that one is, blessed are those who have their strength under control, for they will inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Jesus is probably reflect, reflecting on uh, Psalms 42, verse one and two, which says, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. When can I go and meet with God? Many of us have heard that psalm before, and we probably picture Bambi calmly drinking out of a quiet stream. That's not quite the picture David was trying to paint. Instead, this is a picture of an animal desperately, craw desperately crawling through the desert, looking for water so that they can survive. Jesus, if referring to the same kind, Jesus is referring to the same kind of hunger and thirst. It's desperate. If I don't get this, I will die kind of crazy, craving for God. Jesus is saying, blessed are those that are so desperate to do the will of God that is the only thing in their life. They will be filled, their thirst will be quenched, and their hunger satisfied. And the paraphrase, paraphrase for that one is, blessed are those who are desperate to do the will of God, for they will long for nothing. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. We often have a double standard when it comes to mercy. On one hand, it's like to be shown mercy. On the other hand, we like to see others get what they deserve. Many people hold on tightly to wrongs that have been done against them, and they are justified in doing so. They were wronged. However, by holding on to those wrongs, they are letting go of God's mercy. You cannot hold on to both. Grace seems unfair until you need some. Jesus is teaching us that the good life comes to those that offer what is undeserved. It will not come to those that are stingy with their grace. The good life belongs to those that give the undeserved gift of grace because they were given an undeserved gift of grace. The paraphrase for that one is blessed are, blessed are those who show mercy and forgive for they understand the mercy that's been shown to them. And there's a big, um, that's a big, uh, kind of leads in, uh, oh, come on, Lord, help me out here. Um, what I was saying at the beginning, uh, being kind to people, saying kind things to them, and it, it's, just, it's just the God way. That's what you need to do. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
The religious leaders in Jesus' day were hung up on ceremonial cleanliness. They had a habit of fixing their external appearance while ignoring what was on the inside. Jesus continually called them out on their actions because he saw through them. We too often focus on our outward appearances but ignore our hearts. We think we can just look the part. But Jesus comes along and says something different. He says it's the pure in heart that are blessed. In other words, you shouldn't focus on fixing actions. Instead, focus your heart on Jesus. That's not to say our actions don't matter. They do. We've just reversed the order. When you focus on your heart, your actions will soon follow. Simply put, Jesus is saying, the blessed are those who do the right things for the right reasons. The emphasis is on the motive behind the action, not the action itself. Paraphrase for this one would be, blessed are those who focus on the motive of their actions, for they shall see God. That's where I want to be. That's where I want to be. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. When Jesus uses the word peace, he is saying this, one who has received the peace if God, of God and brings peace to others, not simply one who makes peace, but one who spreads the peace if, if God that he, sh wait a minute, another typo, one who spreads the peace that God has experienced. When Jesus says the peacemakers will be called the sons of God, this is not just a statement of relationships, but of character. In Jesus' day, when you called someone a son of a whatever, whatever, they were saying that you acted like that, good or bad. So when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, he's saying God is a peacemaker. God pursued peace with us when we had absolutely no interest in peace with him. Jesus is also saying something about us. He's saying that when we pursue peace, we are being like God. To be called the son of God was unheard was unheard of to the crowd listening. It's commonplace for us today, but this is a revolutionary teaching. Paraphrase for that one would be, blessed are those who have received peace and bring peace to others, for they are the sons and daughters of God. Blessed are those who are per persecuted for righteous sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you in persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. We all know what persecuted means. What we need to learn is the why. Jesus says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. There are some Christians that get persecuted for saying and doing some really dumb and hurtful things that Jesus never stood for. But when we are persecuted for the things Jesus was persecuted for, then we are blessed. And the paraphrase phrase for that one would be, blessed are you, wait a minute, blessed are you when you are persecuted, what you say and do are consistent with what Jesus says and does, and that doesn't make a lot of sense, but sorry about that. But Jesus isn't done yet. <clears throat> Let's dig a little deeper into the words Jesus uses and see this Beatitudes meaning. The word rejoice is an inter interesting work. It's been translated a bunch of different ways in English, but in the Greek, it was one word and used in many different ways. It was a greeting, so it could be translated as a greetings or a hail or hello. The phrase, the phrase be glad means rejoicing in hope, excessive joy. It means to be joyful beyond what your circumstance should allow. So the question becomes, how can Jesus say he say, be glad in the context of being lied about, criticized, falsely accused, and persecuted. How can he say, rejoice, be glad, joy to you? You need to understand the weight of his words. He's not saying this in a trivial sense. He's not telling us to fake it or to grin and bear it. What he's saying is that there is something in us that endures beyond your current circumstances. There is something in you that despite how hard and bad your life might be, you can tell, still rejoice. And that's the end of the Beatitudes in Matthew. Then in Luke, we have only four Beatitudes. 
and the four woes that follow. So the four Beatitudes in Luke 6, 20 through 26 are, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And the woe that follows that is, But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and you reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated false prophets. And now we're going to go to um, Revelation and see what Revelation has to tell us. Okay. From beginning to end, the Bible is a book of blessings and curses and love. Genesis starts with God blessing the animals and the first animals, and the humans and the first animals, quickly followed by man's disobedience bringing on curses. Revolution marks the fullness of humility's rebellion, humanity's rebellion, with the resulting curses being channel, channeled into end time plagues designed to bring humanity to repentance and back to God and his blessings. And what do we see going on in the world right now? Wow. It's amazing how different things you read in the Bible and you look around you and, and see what's going on in our world right now, and it, it is spot on. It is. In the midst of the plagues of Revelation, seven blessings mark the path toward a time when there will be no curse, no more curse. These blessings are sometimes called the seven Beatitudes of Revelation. Blessings and cursings in the Bible. The blessings in Revelation and throughout the Bible reflect God's love. They are ensured by, a way, a li by living a way that fulfills God's will and is pleasing to him. The curses result from disobedience to God, from breaking through the guardrails that God lovingly gave to protect us and our happiness. Even the curses can serve to alert us to need the need of change. They can, have good res they can have the good result of repentance and conversion. What are the Beatitudes? Beatitudes is a fancy way of saying blessed, based on the Latin word. The most well-known Beatitudes are the ones Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount, starting with blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's in Matthew 3. 5-3. The Greek... No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I don't want to say that Greek word. Okay. The seven Beatitudes of Revelation. The book of Revelation is often, and understandably, remembered as a book warning of end-time plagues and punishments on a sinful world. But scattered through Revelation are seven blessings that give hope and remind us that God's way brings blessings, and in that, in the end, God wins. The number of seven appears repeatedly in the book of Revelation as a number of completeness. Through the, though the seven Beatitudes are not numbered in the book, it seems God inspired that a number of blessings to express the completeness of his plan to bless his people. Seven Beatitudes of Revelation are found in Revelation 1, 3, 14, 13, 16, 15, 19, 9, and 26, and 27, 22, 7, and 14 from the first chapter to the last. They make up an important part of the structure of the book. <clears throat> the first beatitude is in Re Revelations 1, 3. Blessed, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of his pro prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Thank you, thank you. How did you know that? <laughs> That's a lot of words coming out of this old lady's mouth, I'll tell you what. Let's see. Blessed is he who reads and those who bear the words of this prophecy 
and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Studying God's inspired words brings blessings. Those who read and hear it should also keep it, respond, and do what God says to do. The book of Revelation senses the, near, senses the nearness of time, the urgency of the message. Though to, who, though to humans the nearly 2,000 years since John wrote Sing Malong, to God these sure prophetic events are near, and God's timing is perfect. The second beatitude is the Revelation 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Those who obey God will be blessed, even if they die. This has always been true. As the psalmist noted, precious is the sight of the Lord in the death of his saints. Whether we die of natural causes or through persecution, God's plan to resurrect the dead in Christ should be a comfort to all his people. Thinking about martyrdom is never pleasant, but God reframes it as rest from troubles and persecution. The saints, all Christians who have been set apart through baptism and receiving the Holy Spirit, are promised a special, special blessing and rest. The third beatitudes in Revela Revelation 16, 15. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. As the armies of the world gather at Armageddon to battle the returning of Jesus Christ, Jesus himself gives us a reminder and a blessing. People will be unaware of Christ's coming until they watch. This reflects Jesus' Jesus's prophecy. There he warned, but take heed to yourself, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted, counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Putting on proper spiritual garments and avoiding spiritual nakedness are addressed several times in Revelation. The fourth beatitude is in Revelation 19.9. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Revelation 19 moves up to the momentous events surrounding the return of Jesus Christ. Just before his fourth blessing, John heard the sound of mighty thunderings announcing, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to, and to her it was granted to be arrayed to, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen, uh, linen is the righteous act of the saints. The bride of Christ is the church of God, dressed in the fine linen of doing what is right in God's eyes. The fifth beatitude in Revelation 26. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. At Christ's re return, the dead in Christ will be re res resurrected to eternal life to serve with Christ in the kingdom. This resurrection <coughs> before the millennium is called the first resurrection because the rest of the dead will not be resurrected back to physical life for judgment until after the thousand years. Those in the first res resurrection will be saved from the second death, an eternal death from which there is no resurrection. The sixth beatitude is in Revelation 22, seven. Behold, I am coming. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Here in the last chapter of Revelation, Jesus Christ circles back to the message of the first beatitude. Along with the reminder of urgency comes a reminder to hold fast to the prophecies. 
Christians must heed the warnings and be strengthened by the promises. The seventh beatitude is in Revelation 22:14. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. From the beginning, God has sought those who would obey him, thus avoiding the forbidden fruit that produces eternal death and seeking the tree of life that brings the blessing of eternal life. The end of the book not only takes us back to Eden, but forward to the incomparably glorious New Jerusalem. Together, the seven Beatitudes of Revolution sum up many great promises and themes of the Bible, providing hope and direction for those who will worship God through the dark days of the end times. And that's the, the Beatitudes of Revelation. Now I have um, a few verses here that is in Ephesians, which again is in our reading plan for those of you who are doing that. And um, here we go. This is in Ephesians um, 3, 11 to, through 12. All this is proceeding along lines planned all along by God and then executed in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Now this is in the, the Message Bible. I really like this Bible a lot. It just kind of puts, doesn't take anything away, it doesn't put anything added to it. It just kind of explains it in easier to manage and understand. When we trust in him, we are free to say whatever needs to be said, bold to go wherever we need to go. So don't let my present trouble on your behalf get you down. Be proud. My response is to get down on my knees before the Father. This magnificent Father who parcels out all heaven and earth, I ask him to strengthen you by his spirit. Not a brute strength, but a glorious inner strength that Christ will live in you as you open the door and invite him in. And as I ask him that with both feet planted firmly on love, you'll be able to take in with all the followers of Jesus the extravagant dimension of Christ's love. Reach out and experience the breadth, test its length, plumb the depths, depths rise to the heights, live full lives, full in the fullest, fullness of God. If God can do anything, you know that, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. Glory to God in the church. Glory to God in the Messiah in Jesus. Glory down to all generations. Glory through all millennia. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for these words. There's so much truth and so much meaning to all these different places in the Bible that, that you just simply amaze me. Simply amaze me. I know I'm a fairly new Christian and my heart is open to all of the learning and everything I can absorb. And doing these messages in front of my church and in front of you gives me more of an opportunity to research and find out some of the answers that I have questions of. So Lord be with everyone traveling again, everyone in this world that has troubles and every, each and every one that's in this church right now. Have, be blessed, have them blessed. And we just pray this in all Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I have one other thing I want to mention, come to think of it. I, you know, I hear a lot of things going around church and stuff, and sometimes I just slough it off. Other times, sometimes I'm asked to say something to pastor about something. Why me? I don't know. But anyway, in Iwana's the other night, which is a Christian learning place for our children, I heard that there was some bullying going on. And that is not acceptable as far as I'm concerned, especially in the church and especially in the church where we're teaching our children how to act. I'm not quite sure how to go about this. Probably I'll just turn it over to Alan and have him address it. But if not, I surely will because it's just something that
people need to be aware of and something that we, as God's people, do not approve of. So thank you, and have a wonderful weekend. And now we're going to have a few more songs. <laughs>